the final event seminar. And as you know, we have covered a lot of ground and in a really a, a relatively short amount of time. And I hope some challenging concepts have become simple to you and some difficult prophecies have become plain to you. And uh, I know last night, particularly sometimes when the first time someone hears like, hears that message that we heard, it's like a punch in the, in the gut almost. It's like, what? You know, I can't believe it. And, and I, but listen, I understand where you're at. If that was the way you felt last night, I was in the same position you're in 28 years ago. I, I took that same punch in the gut and I thought, what? All these years. I didn't know this is what the Bible said. But, you know, all, I, all, all we can do is, is um, just pray and follow the Lord. And, you know, there's, there's a, a blessing that comes from studying God's Word and following it that you don't get in any other way. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18 says, But the path of the just is, the, is as the shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. And so the more we study God's Word and the more we follow His Word, the brighter the path gets. And so that's how the process can keep getting brighter even as we get older. You know, it's been 28 years ago I studied this. And so, you know, Jesus it, it continues to bless us as we continue to follow his word. And, but the more, you know, the more you learn, uh, like I said, the more that path grows brighter and things get clear. And there's just nothing like it. And so we're going to keep learning new things. And it's my hope that we'll be learning some things uh, that will be of interest and of benefit to you. Everything's not going to be a punch in the gut, I promise you. You'll just be blessed by a lot of the stuff we'll be looking at. And, uh, and I hope you're going to be appreciating Jesus and his word more. Because that's the purpose of this, is, is to get to know Jesus. And, and you get to know Jesus through his word and through prayer and study. And, and so that's what we're wanting to do. Now, tonight... Um, uh, is, is night actually this morning was session number seven and I forgot this morning so those who were here this morning actually could have received your concordances this morning I just forgot about it so uh, so tonight uh, when you leave if you've been here the, the seven sessions uh, make sure we you pick one up on the way out or let Jared or me or somebody back there in the back that's helping out know uh, now I've got to admit something to you if tonight some of you go home with a concordance and I don't see you again I'm going to question your motives. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you've earned it. You've put up with it for seven, at least seven sessions. And so uh, if you haven't been here seven yet, if you've been here six or five or whatever, just keep coming. When you get to session number seven, we'll have one for you. Tonight's subject is Revelation Forgotten History. We'll be getting into that soon enough. But tomorrow night... We're really looking at a very interesting subject that a lot of people don't know how much detail the Bible tells about. And you're going to see this tomorrow night. The, the revel, uh, final events reveals the mystery of death. We're going to talk about a lot of things. We'll look at ghosts and demons and uh, near-death experiences and purgatory and hell and heaven and all that stuff. So be here tomorrow night. We'll let the Bible explain all those things to us. Uh, Monday and Tuesday nights, no meetings, remember. And what I don't want you to do is forget, and, well, it's over. No, we'll be back Wednesday night. Uh, Wednesday night, the subject is God's strange act. And we're going to look at what the Bible says about the subject of hell. We're going to see, like I've told you a couple of times, what the Bible says about uh, the location of hell. We're going to look at, at the, the population of hell. We'll see some interesting things that the scripture teaches about hell and hellfire and all of that. So make sure you hear. It's one of those topics that's really an eye-opener to folks when you cover that. So that's Wednesday night. And then Thursday night subject is Revelation's Millennial Reign. Now, this is one of my favorite uh, subjects and topics during the seminar. Um, I, I, I like this. It's very clear. It's kind of laid out right there for you in Revelation chapter 20. But we're also going to look at this millennial reign, this thousand-year period, and also... And we're going to look at the topic of heaven some that night. So I've never combined those two together. So it's going to be another one of those I'm putting two sermons together type things. But hopefully uh, we'll work it out where it'll turn out all right. So um, anyway, uh, Thursday night, so I guess that's it. It's time for the question and answers. And we did get a couple turned in last night. I think I've got three questions. I want to try and cover those. And um, I want to put one first for a specific reason because I... 
if you noticed, I grabbed my computer and I took it and came back. It's because I wanted to put some text on the screen for you that goes along with this question. And so someone asked the question, and unfortunately, that person is not here tonight. So I'm almost tempted to wait and answer it when she's back. Um, but I think I'm going to go ahead and, uh, anyhow. I'll, I'll talk to her privately about it. But she asked the question this, why do we suppose uh, or what are we supposed to do all day on the Sabbath? So she's wondering, okay, I've, I've learned this information about the Sabbath. What are we supposed to do? Uh, here is, is a Bible answer, or at least one Bible answer. I wrote several things down on the back of this card, several things that was coming to my mind. But here's one of them. This is the first text that came to my mind, so this is one I want to put on the screen. This is Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13 and 14. Speaking of the, of the Sabbath, it says, The holy day of the Lord, I guess I forgot one of the texts, shame on me. Uh, the holy day of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him. In fact, I want to go there because I want to read this correctly. Isaiah chapter 58. All that running back there with my computer for nothing. Isaiah 58, or at least for not the whole thing anyhow, says if it begins out saying, uh, it begins saying, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath day a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and thou shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. And then verse 14, let's see what I have here. Uh, then, then it goes on, Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And so, God's, this, here's one thing it says about the Scripture. It says this a day, he says, if you, if you, if you keep my Sabbath, and, and basically what this text says is it's not a day designed just for me. It's a day designed to honor God. It's a day to, to get to know God. He says, if you'll turn away on this one day and you'll make it special, he said, because, you know, God, we saw last night, made it a holy day. He said, if you'll turn and you'll treat this day different than other days and you'll honor me on that day and not honor yourself and not just do your own things and not do your normal things, but if you'll spend your time and you'll worship me and develop your relationship with me on that day, he says, I'll cause you to ride on the high places of the earth. And so there's a special blessing promise for keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Um, of course, I'm going to just list a couple things because we got a lot to cover tonight. But of course, it's a day of corporate worship. I mean, we, we looked at that in a text or two last night. We saw that's what Jesus did, Luke 4, 16. So it's a day to come to worship God together. Um, you know, and some people say, well, I, I can worship every day. Well, we can worship God every day, and we should worship God every day, but you can only worship on one holy day, because God only made one day holy. So, and he only one, made one day that he said, this is the day I want you to worship on. Is it wrong to worship another day? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying there's only one day we can worship on, which God told us to worship on. Um, you can visit and minister the sick people, shut-ins, those sort of things. You can enjoy nature with your family. Um, but the Bible is very clear. We're not going to take time to look at that commandment tonight because of, of the, sh the things we have to cover as of yet. But Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11 says, we're not supposed to work. It's a day where we set aside our secular labor from sunset to sunset. That's how Bible reckons time, and I think we'll talk about that tonight. But um, from evening unto evening shall you celebrate your Sabbath, the Bible says. And so from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, we don't do our regular jobs. We, we, uh, we arrange it with our employers. Whatever we need to do, we say, this is God's holy day. Um, I, I, I'm obligated to follow my Heavenly Father that day. So anyway, it's not a day devoted to ourselves. It's for our relationship to God. It's a day to rest as well. So anyway, I'll talk with her privately also when she gets back. Next question. So Saturday's a Sabbath day. Uh, how or what do you celebrate Easter? Okay, well, that's a good question. If, if Saturday's the Sabbath and we know that Jesus rose on Sunday, how do we celebrate that? Well, what we tend to do here in this church is on that, the Sabbath before the Resurrection Sunday, we will have a special message dedicated to Jesus, His resurrection, or whatever. And I have it in places where, and I haven't done it here since I've been here in the last three and a half years or so, but uh, I have had places where on Sunday we'd have a special sunrise service. So it's okay to do that, and sometimes we might do that. We just haven't done that since I've been here, so they may have done that before. But So there's, that's kind of what we do. And here goes an interesting question, and I get this sometimes. I haven't got it every seminar, but it says, according to the Bible verse, and th this is not a Bible verse, but 
But I'm just going to read the question. And I didn't have the person's name to clarify. So part of this I'm just figuring out for myself. It says, according to the Bible verse about not showing leg, <laughs> uh, is it okay to wear pants? Now, first of all, the Bible doesn't say anything. There's no verse about saying not showing any leg. Uh, the, the, I think what they're, I think this is a lady that's questioning, because uh, she does say not trying to look like a man. So it's Deuteronomy 22, verse 5 is where we'll find the answer to that, this question. I'll tell you what I think she's asking. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. You know, there's, um, <clears throat> I think what, it's a, what she's wondering about, this is Deuteronomy 22, 5. It says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that, are, that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So I think her question, or the intention of her question was, she says, is it okay to wear pants? And so, uh, and, and there was a time when ladies didn't wear pants in the church. But what the Bible, the Bible principle, we have to go by the principles of the Scripture, it's saying that a woman doesn't wear a man's clothes, a man doesn't wear a woman's clothes. So, pants are made today for women. They're made for the shape of a woman, the body of a woman, who is very different from a man's body. And so, it's just saying, we don't wear, I, I should, if I come up here in a dress, right? That'd be pretty sad. I, I would leave if I were y'all. And so, but if, if ladies come up when you're wearing men's clothing, it's just not right. We're supposed to separate those things. So I think that's the principle is that we're not to wear, not to mix up uh, men and women's clothing and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a whole lot more that could be said on that. But anyway, let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight for, your, for the holy Sabbath day we've enjoyed today and um, and, and now as we begin this, this seminar tonight, we want to look at some important, a very, uh, a very important topic. And, and so, as always, we need your Holy Spirit, and we're praying for it. Lord, I pray that you'll help me. Lord, I, I want to present this in the way you'd have me to do that. And so, please, may I have your spirit here as I share tonight. And may our ears be open to hear. And may your presence be felt here in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, Revelation's Forgotten History. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, as we've looked at some, uh, a lot of interesting subjects, we've been uh, asking for the Word of God to be our final authority, not my opinion or your opinion or Billy Graham's or Chuck Swindoll's or whatever. We've been wanting to thus set the Lord, right? And so that's what we keep going to. And it really doesn't matter what I think or what my opinion is. And frankly, it doesn't matter what you think or what your opinion is. It only matters what the Bible says, right? And so that's what we want to see. Uh, and so, anyway, uh, God's Word is what's important. And so, that's what we've been looking at night after night. And I've been challenging you to study for yourself. I've been giving you these texts, and, and you take them, you study, you read for yourself. I want you to keep doing that. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I think uh, uh, the other night, I think it was Thursday night, I asked uh, all of you to, that wanted to, to take a stand for Jesus to take a stand. And I think everybody stood that night that could. Um, and, and it was because we're showing the devil and we're showing Jesus, I'm on, on Jesus' side. I want to take a stand for Jesus. I want to show him and the world this is who I'm standing for. And so Jesus is the truth, and we want to follow him, and we're going to keep doing that. We want to keep looking at Jesus, looking at his word. And so I want to do a quick summary of some of the things we've covered to kind of catch us up. We went through those kingdoms. I'm not going to cover them all right now because we've got a lot to cover tonight. But we went through those kingdoms. We saw it in Daniel 2. We saw it in Daniel 7. We saw both of them came to those t the 10 divisions of Europe in one way or another. And then we saw there was added information in Daniel 7. Those, those 10 horns was broken up and, uh, and a little horn come up among them and destroyed or killed three of them or wiped out three of those uh, 10 kingdoms. And so on this past Sunday, we begin to ask the question, who is this little horn that pushed up three of the 10? And we begin to see that this little horn power is the one and the same in, from Daniel 7 as the, the Antichrist power, the beast power, the first beast in Revelation chapter 13. And so, but we still hadn't identified who this beast power was. Then on Sunday night, we went through a total of 10 characteristics from the scriptures, and I asked you to tell me who it was, and many of you told me that this Antichrist power, this papacy, this beast, was the Vatican City the, or, or the Catholic system of teachings. It was not the Pope. It's not 
referring to a single person. We saw that um, in Revelation 13, that that beast, the Antichrist, would receive a deadly wound, and that wound would be healed. And we saw the other night in 1798, the papacy ruled for 1,230 years. We call it the Dark Ages. So from 538 to 1798, they ruled. In 1798, uh, 1798 uh, the French general uh, Berthier came in. He took the pope captive. The papacy was in an end, so the world thought. But the Bible said that wound would heal. And then in 1929, the Lateran Treaty was, was signed. And this is between uh, the papacy and, um, and Italy. And they gave them their power back again. And so the wound began to be healed. And, and the power and the influence of the papacy, and particularly of the pope, has grown and grown and grown since that time until now, you know, the, 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 the pope's influence is, is worldwide, is spread over, this, over the earth. And so anyway... Um, the papacy, you know, back in the dark ages, uh, the, the, at that point, you know, we saw at the beginning that there was these two sides that always came up. And then the Reformation began with Luther. And Luther, who was a, uh, a Catholic priest, began to protest the teachings of Rome. He nailed his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg. And, and so they were 95 things he enumerated and said, these are the things that this church is teaching that go contrary to what the scriptures say. And so when he nailed them there, it started a whole, uh, you know, what we call the Reformation. And that's why uh, they were, they were uh, protesting. That's why we call Protestant churches. They were protesting the teachings of Rome. And that's why the Adventist church is a Protestant church. The Baptist church is a Protestant church. The Lutheran church is a Protestant church. And so those churches are Protestant because they protest the teachings of Rome. But in the last few years, there's a pr famous preacher, Tony Palmer, and one you probably heard of, Kenneth Copeland. And just a few years ago, I watched a video that they shared a video by Pope Francis, and, and it was on unity among the churches. And then these two pastors gathered up together, and they had grouped to uh, announce to this large group of these evangelical ministers. They said, the protest is over. And it is over to a large degree. Protestantism, the Protestant churches, are not protesting anymore the, t the teachings, the false teachings of, of the Catholic system. And so anyway, but the reasons for the protest that they started in the beginning have not changed. One iota, those reasons are still there. And so what I'm preaching is not politically correct, and I realize that. But I also realize that I am first and foremost accountable to the Lord. And so... You know, I'm just going to share these truths as kindly as I can, but I've got to teach the truth nonetheless. Um, you know, some may remember that whenever uh, John F. Kennedy was elected president, you remember what the controversy was over about him? He was Catholic. He was the first Catholic president, and the people were afraid in this nation that the papacy would start to have the influence over the United States. And so there was huge protests. I've looked back into history and some of the archives and things, and, and you can see even some, some of the cartoons back then that they put in the newspapers, you know, the political cartoons. And, and just amazing some of the stuff they see uh, that, that was going on when they were, they were protesting the fact that they thought John F. Kennedy might be a puppet in the hand of the papacy and ruling uh, and being the president of our, of our country. So anyway, uh, I share with you how this is no new teaching. This, the, the thing that I've been sharing with you is, is nothing new. The Protestant churches have taught this for years and years and years. John Knox, who founded the Presbyterians, he taught it. Uh, John Calvin, who started uh, Calvinism. Luther, of course, who started the Lutheran Church. Roger Williams, who founded the very first Baptist church on American soil. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodists, and Dwingley and Melanchthon, and a, a whole group of, of what we call the Protestant Reformers. They preached what I'm preaching. Um, and again, I want to make this very clear uh, this is not a, a Catholic bashing session, okay? Uh, this is not against any individual Catholic people or the people who are members of the Catholic Church. This is simply sharing what the Bible says and sharing what has been taught in the Protestant churches since the Protestant churches began. So, no, 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 uh, nothing against individual Catholics. This is against that system of false teachings. That's very important to know. 
We saw on Thursday night this lawless one, the Antichrist, would try and change God's law. We saw that the fourth commandment testifies to God uh, as, as our creator, as our creator God, and that Satan wants to change God's law. And we have saw over and over in this issue in the last days is worship. It's a battle that Satan wants the throne of God. He wants to be worshiped, and he wants to take the place of the Lord. And so... Anyway, the fourth commandment points out like no other commandment that, because it points out that God is our creator, that Satan could not and will never be deserving of worship. So anyway, when God finished creating planet Earth and man, he created the Sabbath as a memorial of creation on the seventh day of the week. Um, and when he wrote his law on Sinai, he put it in the heart of the Ten Commandments there in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 in 10 says remember the sabbath day to keep it holy six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work but the seventh day is the sabbath of the lord thy god so isn't it logical if this commandment points out that god is our creator he is the he is the lord our god this is uh, satan would attack god's law he would try and do away with God's law. We talked about the other night how that's, you, that's the best way to take down a government is not just to take out its leaders, because other leaders will rise up, but to, to attack it at its governmental level, its law, the level of its laws. So this little horn power would speak, to, uh, would speak these great words and would think to change God's times and laws. And we saw over and over the last few nights that one of the ways they did this was, you know, we had the Ten Commandments and the Second Commandment about not worshiping idols or whatever. The Catholics in their catechism, their teaching catechism, I have one in my office, you know, where they took out, they said, well, we, we can't go along with this Second Commandment because it, it goes against what we do. We worship, we pray to idols, we pray to, you know, statues, we pray to Mary, et cetera. I told you an example of a guy I knew. And so they said, we can't have the Second Commandment. So they erased it. And what they did to make up to still have 10 was they took the 10th Commandment and they made it into two. And so they still have 10 Commandments. But they've erased the second. Now, all, most Catholics are not even aware of this. Most people haven't gone through the catechisms and haven't read through some of these books. But this is the official teachings uh, of, of that system. So anyway, we saw it didn't stop there. We saw that last night the fourth commandment uh, was attempted to be changed. And we saw also that, that that's when Jesus worshipped. On the, on the seventh day of the week, Jesus went in the synagogue and he worshipped. That was his custom to do. And so, let me ask you this, as we kind of kick into tonight, and man, we're already 25 after, did I say last night to anyone that those who worship on Sunday are lost? No, I didn't say that. Did I say those who worship on Sunday are worshiping the beast? No, I didn't say that. Did I say only those who worship on the seventh day Sabbath are saved? No, I didn't say that. Did I say Jesus doesn't love you if you don't worship him on the Sabbath? No. And that, that wasn't my intention. And, 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 and um, there's no question the vast majority of Christians today worship on Sunday, which according to the Bible actually is, is the first day of the week. You know, God gave a number to each day of the week, but the Sabbath, the seventh day, he gave it a name, the Sabbath. The rest of them were just numbered, first day, second day, third day, etc. The fourth day, I mean, excuse me, the seventh day was the Sabbath. And so I want to ask the obvious question. How did we come to this place in the majority of the Christian world tonight or in tomorrow that most of the Christians will be worshiping on Sunday, the first day of the week, rather than Saturday or Sabbath, the seventh day of the week? Who did it? How did this change take place? So we're going to spend some time tonight. We're going to see some historical quotes. We're going to look at the scriptures. And I want you to understand how all this took place. And I took some time this afternoon and, and, and did some more research and put some more things together that was interesting to me. And so I hope it, it makes it even clearer to you tonight as we go through this. So there's some new stuff in this message tonight that I haven't shared before. But uh, anyway, how did the majority of Christians today worship the first day, end up worshiping the first rather than the seventh? Now, I'm going to look tonight with you. First thing we're going to do is we're going to look at eight, uh, every text, I should say, in the New Testament that mentions the first day of the week. There's only eight of them. And so you would think in these, in these uh, eight texts, we should find some evidence for worshiping on another day, on the first day of the week rather than on the seventh day. So we're going to look at every one in the New Testament because everyone says, well, the change came in the New Testament because there's a text in the Old Testament, but there's no use looking at it because it doesn't relate to us as New Testament Christians. So anyway, um, 
I don't think there's any question that in the Old Testament, the Seventh-day Sabbath was kept. But the question in people's minds today is, is how do we get changed now? Um, we looked at verse after verse last night where we saw that the disciples kept the Sabbath after Jesus had died and ascended, went back to heaven. And so what I'm doing here tonight, let me make this clear, is I'm looking for proof to keep Sunday. Uh, there are 112 texts in the Bible that say we should keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. So the Sabbath, the Seventh-day Sabbath is not on trial tonight. Worship on the first day is what's on trial. That's what we want to look at. So it's, the Seventh-day Sabbath is clearly pointed out in Scripture. So anyway, if it's in the Bible, we ought to be able to find some evidence for it. So again, let me remind you, I'm not trying to be insensitive about any of this. Uh, I'm kind of in a rush, so I hope it doesn't come across as being insensitive. But I know I've got a lot to cover. But uh, I know some of this came as a shock to some of you last night. And I understand. I've been there. Uh, but I just want to see what the Bible says. So let's go and begin to see this. The first text we find, number one, is Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. <clears throat> when you go to the first gospel in Matthew chapter 28, here's the first time, the first reference to the first day of the week. This is the New King, I mean, excuse me, the King James Version of the Bible that I'll be having on the screen like I've done every night. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Okay, it mentions the first day of the week. It also mentions the Sabbath, by the way. But does this give us any indication that there was a change made here? Let's worship on this day rather than this day. No, it's just a simple account of these two Marys. They're coming to the tomb to, 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 to minister to Jesus, to see Jesus' body. To, and, but it's nothing about worship, nothing about a change of day. So the first one, let's exit out. Let's go to the next one. The second one is found in Mark chapter 16, verse 1 and verse 2. I'm going to read verse 1 just, to, just for the context. Mark chapter 16, verse 1 says, And when the Sabbath was passed, so the Sabbath is done now, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome who brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. So they're coming, these Marys and Salome is coming to anoint the body of Jesus. Remember we, we saw last night that they said we're not going to anoint him because it's the Sabbath. We're going to wait till the Sabbath is passed. So now the Sabbath is over in verse 2. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Okay, the same question. As we look at this second text in the Gospels, and now, by the way, on your handout tonight, they'll have all of these texts on there. Um, we look at Mark's account here. We, we, it's just a, a, the same account of what Matthew just shared. No change. No, doesn't say anything about changing the day of worship. It's just saying the two Marys in Salome, they came to the tomb. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 9 <clears throat> The third place is mentioned in, in the New Testament. It says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast out seven devils. Does that text tell us, let's worship another day? No, it just says Jesus rose on the first day. We know that. We admit that. That's, I mean, that's, that's the resurrection day, Jesus rose. And next text, number four, John chapter 20, verse 1. And uh, by the way, you can see the page numbers if you have those uh, seminar Bibles there, if you want to try and keep up. John chapter 20, verse 1 says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So it's the same account as Mark and, and, and Matthew's account here. It's just Luke's account, or excuse me, of John's account uh, of what's taking place, just John's perspective. So it's the same thing. It doesn't say anything. It mentions the first day of the week when they came. And Jesus wasn't there. Same thing. Let's go to the next one. So the first four texts say nothing about worship, change in day of worship, anything like that. The next one, John chapter 20, verse 19, says, In the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, here's the first appearance that we find here in John, in the book of John, where Jesus appears after the resurrection. And it says the disciples are gathered together. It says it's the first day of the week. It says in the evening, it was that evening being the first day of the week, the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled. For what reason does it say? For fear of the Jews. 
It doesn't say they were there. You know, some people say, well, this is a, clearly a religious meeting. The text says they were there on the first day of the week. But the Bible says they were there because of the fear of the Jews. Jesus had just been killed. They nailed him to a cross. And so they were afraid for their lives. We're the followers of this man who was just condemned as a heretic and nailed cruelly to a cross. And so they were afraid of the same fate. And so they were hiding out as all they were doing. They were, they were on the down low as all was taking place here. It says nothing about a worship service. It says nothing about changing a day of worship. It just says the disciples, they were afraid. Remember, Jesus died on, on Friday, and so now they're afraid. They're hiding out. That's all it says. It says Jesus appeared among them. Does it say anything about a change of a day of worship? Some people say, well, they're doing this in the, in the honor of the resurrection. Well, there's no scriptural evidence for that. It just says they're hiding for fear of the Jews. They were afraid for their lives. In fact, I, I want to point out another text to you. At this point, the disciples, when you think, well, they were meeting for, uh, in honor of the resurrection, the disciples did not even believe in the resurrection at this point. Look at this text. Mark chapter uh, 16, verse 14 says, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them. In other words, he castigated them. He, he, he gave them down the road, uh, uh, upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So the disciples at this point, this was later on when Jesus appeared to them again. And, and Jesus kind of upbraided them, it says, because they didn't even believe those who had said he's been resurrected. So they certainly wasn't there in honor of the resurrection. Let's have a worship service cause, or a praise service because Jesus rose again. They didn't even believe it at this point. So there's nothing to suggest a change in the day of worship. It merely happens to be the first day of the week. All right, let's go to another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and verse 2. <clears throat> It says, now concerning the collection for the saints, I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do. This is Paul speaking to the, to the Corinthian believers. And on the first day of the week, there we go, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Now let's look at what this text says and what it doesn't say here. Does it say it's the first day of the week? Yes, it does say that. Uh, does it say we're having a worship service? It does not say that. But some say, wait, they're taking up a collection. We've got the deacons, deacons going through the aisles. They're passing out the, the plate. But you know what? We're seeing that from our 24th century perspective. That's not what they did back then. In fact, uh, notice what it says. On the, he says, lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And again, we have this picture of the deacons, but Paul is saying, lay something up in store. In fact, in the Greek, this literally, re literally reads, let everyone lay by him at home a certain amount. That's what the, in the Greek, the literal rendition of this, this, this little phrase says. So this was actually, as I'll show you, was an emergency relief effort to gather food and to gather things to take to a, uh, other believers who were, who were in a famine. There was a famine that was going on among the believers in the area of Judea and Jerusalem, and Paul was telling the Corinthian believers to gather up some things so we can take this food, these, these offerings to these hungry believers. In fact, I want to show you Acts chapter 11, verse 29. It says this, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. So there's this famine going. Another one, Romans chapter 15, verse 25 and verse 26. And he says, but, and this is Paul speaking, says, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which were at Jerusalem. So all Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians is, listen, get your stuff together, he says, do it up on, start doing it on the first day of the week because he can't go up and gather your fruit. They wouldn't want him going and gathering crops on the Sabbath. That's work. So he says, starting, to, uh, you know, starting tomorrow on the first day of the week, I want you to go out to your fields, whatever, this week, start gathering things together, have it all here, so when I come, you won't have to do all this. It'll be ready to go so I can gather it up and take it to those believers who are hungry. That's all that's taking place right here. Is that simple? We saw last night from the second book of Corinthians um, that 
in Acts chapter 18, it showed us that Paul worshiped in the Corinthian, uh, Corinthian church with, with, uh, on every Sabbath, not on Sunday. And we saw that Paul is simply here. He's simply reminding them. He said, right away, at the beginning of the week, start gathering this stuff together. Um, we saw last night 84 times in, in uh, Paul worshiped on the Sabbath in the Corinth, 84 times that we can, that we can count. And so don't forget... Bible prophecy, this is what we're here for, said that this little horn power, this Antichrist power, would attempt to make a change in God's law. It wouldn't be God's people that made the change. Let's continue. Our next text, the seventh out of eight, Acts chapter 20, verse 7 through 11. Here's another one that kind of can confuse folks. Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 7, <clears throat> says, Upon the first day of the week, so is that the first the Sunday? Where, here's, here's the mention of the first day of the week. Uh, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart to on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight, in verse 8. And there were many lights, notice that, in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, in verse 9. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Verse 10, And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. Verse 11, When he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread, and eaten, and talked a long while, even till break of day, Paul still hadn't learned anything. He kept talking to the break of day, so he departed, it said. And so, what can we learn from this story? Don't go to sleep in church. And you could turn it back on me. You could say, don't preach too long, right? But anyway, the story is very clear. It does take place on the first day of the week. Very clearly, there's no question about that. There's no confusion on that. Uh, but the conclusion that people come to was this means here's the change of worship. Let's read the story carefully and see what the Bible says, not what we think it says. Paul preached until midnight. And then again, it says, after this, this Eutychus fell and out the window and broke his neck or whatever happened and died, and he, he brought him back to life, he went back, he said he kept on preaching till the next day, till daybreak. And so, it's clear that it was night because he said there were, uh, there were uh, in the previous text, it said there was uh, candles in the room, I think I'd read. And so anyway, if you remember this, we mentioned this last night, and if I didn't make it clear... I mentioned it earlier tonight, actually, also. The biblical day begins at sunset. When we read through the Genesis account the other night, a couple of nights ago, I think it was, maybe it was last night, at, at the end of each day, God said, in the evening and the morning were the first day, and the evening and the morning were the second day, and the evening and the morning were the third day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So biblical time goes from sunset to sunset. And so that's why, if you know any uh, uh, Jews, they worship from Friday at sunset to Saturday at sunset. That's the biblical Sabbath. They've been keeping the Sabbath since, since there was a Jew in, you know, in Abraham and, and Jacob's time. And so anyway, uh, the biblical day begins at sunset. And we're also, by the way, told to keep it that way in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 32. It says, It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, from even until even shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So the meeting that we were just reading about that Paul in 1 Corinthians took place on what we would call Saturday night. The sun had set. Remember it said he preached until midnight. And then, then the next, anyway, we'll continue on. So it, this, this was not a Sunday morning service. You know, again, we're picturing Sunday morning there in church the first day of the week. No, they, they met on Sabbath. They preached like they always did. They met on the Sabbath. It turned dark. He preached on to midnight, as it said, he, and, and, and kept on going even to the break of day. And so Paul was preaching, as we'll see in a moment, his farewell sermon to these believers. He spent the Sabbath day with them. Now it was the evening part of the day, what we would call Saturday night, like we're in right now, I guess. Sun, has it been sunset? Yeah, I think it has. Um, and so Paul was preaching on a Saturday night. That's what we're doing right now. This is, biblically speaking, this is the first day of the week now. Now, is it wrong? I, I don't mean to spend much time on this, but is it wrong to call days uh, to, to go by from midnight to midnight? No, there's nothing wrong with that uh, for the rest of the week. 
But the Sabbath said, God said on the Sabbath is sunset to sunset. The rest of the week, we can keep it however we want to. But anyway, biblically speaking, right now, this is when Paul was speaking that night on a Saturday night. And so I want you to notice something. Uh, this is the New English uh, Bible translation. And I just want to share this one verse from, from this version just to show you. It says, On Saturday night in our assembly for the breaking of bread, and this is that same, this is Acts 20, verse 7. Uh, on Saturday night in our assembly for the breaking of bread, Paul, who was about to leave the next day, addressed them and went on speaking unto midnight. And so those, those translators of the, of the Bible, they knew what was going on there. And so you can see from this one version, it makes it very clear. But I want to lay out a sequence for you here on the screen so you can see. Paul began preaching on the seventh day. He started on Saturday. He began to preaching until Saturday night. All right, sunset came. So now the first day of the week started. So he says he preached on the first day of the week. He preached on until midnight. And then he preached till midnight, it says, on, on that Saturday night. And then it says he continued to the morning and on the first day of the week. He, he, he says he departs. In fact, uh, we'll find in just a moment, or I'll share you now. In the morning, on Sunday morning, he walked 20 miles to, to catch a ship. And you can find out where it tells how far, and this is Acts chapter 20, verse 13 and 14. It was a, it was a 20 or 30 mile uh, journey that he made to get on a ship because he was leaving. That's why he stayed all night. This is my last night with you guys. And so he stayed with them all night. The next morning he, he walked, walked to that ship and he departed from them. And so he wouldn't have done that on, on the Sabbath day. And so another question people have about this, they say, well, why did he, why did he says they broke bread. Well, doesn't that mean they're having a communion service? No, it means they were eating a meal. Acts chapter 2 verse 46 tells us that the disciples broke bread every day. It says they were daily in the temple breaking bread with one another. They were sharing a meal. They had all things in common, it tells you. You look in Acts chapter 2, 3, and especially 2 and 4, you'll find over and over it talks about how the believers had everything in common. They sold their things and they put it in a pot, so to speak. They were kind of communal living in a way at the beginning there of the Christian church. And all is saying is that they were having a meal with one another. It's nothing about a communion service or a Lord's Supper. And again, there's no indication about anything about a change of a day of worship. There are two, thir two terms I want to uh, bring up to you quickly, uh, very quickly. Exegesis and eisegesis. Uh, you know, in, in my studies, you know, when you go to, to school for the ministry, you, you go through some ministry classes and different things. And, and one of the things they teach you is exegesis is when you, ask, when you take the scriptures and you exegete from the passage what it says. You look up the words, you look up the, the Hebrew or the Greek meanings, and you exegete, you dig into what the word actually says. Eisegesis is like the opposite of that. It's eisegesis is when we just take from the scripture what we want to take from it. And so we've got to be careful when you're looking at the scriptures, particularly things like this, that we're exegeting the passage. We're not eisegeting it. We're not trying to get what we think it says, but we're learning what it actually says. Let's look at the final text that mentions the first day of the week and see, see if it gives us any reason to worship on that day. If not, frankly, there is no, t no proof whatsoever in the scriptures to do that. Luke 23, beginning in verse 56 and they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. That's every text in the New Testament that mentions the first day of the week. And there is absolutely none. You can see from the Bible, there's no biblical evidence that Christ or the disciples or anyone ever changed the day of worship. It would have been the lead uh, emphasis in every New Testament book had such a dramatic change been made. It would have been made very clear to the believers. Hey, we've changed God's commandments. They didn't do that. Psalm 89 verse 34 says, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. God's law has not changed and no one has the right to alter God's law. You know, in fact, I want to share some quotes. Scholars from various uh, uh, first day or Sunday keeping groups acknowledge this. This is uh, actually uh, Cardinal Gim uh, James Gibbons, and he's a Catholic cardinal. He said this, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. 
The scriptures enforce, excuse me, the religious observance of Saturday. This is from the book, The Faith of Our Fathers, page 89. Uh, Clovis Chapel, who was a Methodist minister, he said this, The reason we observe the first day of the, uh, instead of the seventh day is based on no positive command. One will search the scriptures in vain for authority from changing the seventh day to the first. So how did it occur? How do we make this switch? Remember, the Antichrist power would think to change God's times and laws. <clears throat> and don't forget that Satan wants his place. Uh, he wants to undermine God's government and God's authority, and he does that by attacking, attacking God's law. So I want to take some time now. We're going to look at a few historical things, and, and we'll see how this has this taken place over time. From the time of Babylon, there's always been a cult of sun worship. And they worship, uh, they, they worship the sun on this day. And the day that they worship the sun was on Sunday. That's why it's named Sunday. It's named after the sun. And so the worship of the sun was done on, the, on, on Sunday, the first day of the week. It started in Babylon. It went to Egypt. It went to Medo-Persia and Greece. And it's, it's gone through the centuries and so sun worship flourished during every world empire. And then we come down to the time of the disciples. And let's see now how the Christians went from, from worshiping on the Sabbath to worshiping on Sunday. And to understand how this swap happened, you've got to understand the relationship between the Roman government and, and the Jewish people and the Christians at that time. And it will help you clear this up for you. And I spent some time on this this afternoon. But the Jewish people, as we know, resented Roman rule over them, right? They thought that when the Messiah come, he's going to deliver them from Roman rule. He thought they would free them. And so <clears throat> their animosity was so strong that they finally, it turned into rebellion. <clears throat> and there were many of these uh, rebellions that they had. But in 70, in fact, there was one I couldn't, I couldn't, didn't take time to look it up this afternoon. But there, just before Jesus died, they, ref, they, they referred to a rebellion that occurred. But anyway... Um, in 70 A.D., you, you, uh, Roman general Titus came in. He destroyed Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple, burned it to the ground. Jesus refers to it over in Matthew chapter 24. And so, because of these rebellions, <clears throat> Rome was keeping a suspicious eye on, on the Jews all the time. And so, and although the Jews didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah... The Jews and the Christians all worshipped on the seventh day of the week because the Christians came in, they were worshipping, that's when Jesus worshipped on, so they were all worshipping the same day except for the Rome and the other religions who worshipped on Sunday. And so we had the Christians, we had the Jews worshipping on the same day, so it kind of associates them together. But the Jews kept rebelling against Rome, and so they were causing problems for the, for the government of Rome. And so anyway... Uh, these uprisings continued, instigated by these Jewish leaders, and the hostility between Rome and the Jews began to grow. And so at this point, the Jews and the Christians, again, they're worshiping on the same day, and they're not worshiping together, but the same day. And so here's how it, how it began to change. You know, the Jews still worship on the seventh day Sabbath, right? You know that. Many church historians place the beginning uh, of a gradual change of day somewhere between 70 A.D. and 135 A.D. These were when the, the, these two major uprisings of the Jews were. So we just referred to one with Titus there in 70 A.D., but there was another one in 135 A.D. And there's a church historian. His name is Dr. Samuel Bakioki. And he wrote on this subject. By the way, it was interesting to find out that he was the first non-Catholic to ever graduate from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. And so the first non-Catholic to ever do that. And so he, he was able to study in their archives deeply. And I've got several books by him, and he gets into some stuff in there, by the way. Uh, and he wrote a book called Divine Rest for Human Restlessness. And he said this, Beginning with the first Jewish revolt against Rome, various repressive measures, military, political, and fiscal, were imposed by the Romans on the Jews. And so what he's saying is, 
because the Jews kept instigating revolts and causing problems, Rome began to buckle down on them. They began to, to make things difficult with, with them by their, their oppressing them politically and taxation, etc. So they began to make things hard on the Jews because of the, pre, the rebellion they were doing. And again, you got to consider those Jews and the Christians all worship on the seventh day Sabbath. And so the Christians were associated with the Jews because of that day and everybody else was worshiped on another day. And so anyway, the emperor of Rome at this time was Hadrian. And this is what happened. Hadrian at this time prohibited the practice of the Jewish religion throughout the empire. And notice this, condemning especially Sabbath observance. And so the emperor of Rome began to condemn all Jewish religion and particularly Sabbath observance because that differentiated the Jews from the Romans and those who worship on the first day of the week. Um, so these revolts by the Jews led Hadrian to do this. And on top of all of this, there was a conflict between the Jews and the Christians. You can read about that several places, about some questions they had between one another in the New Testament. Uh, and so now we've got a prohibition of the Jewish religion, and they were easy to distinguish because of their day of worship. But of course, the Christians worship on the same day. And so the mounting hostility between the two uh, coupled with the, with the conflict between the Jews and the Christians, it encouraged a rash of anti-Jewish literature. Now, we're familiar with that. I mean, you've, you've heard of, of anti-Semitism. And so this started way, a long, long time ago. And so anyway, for obvious reasons, Christians began to want to find ways to disassociate themselves from the Jews who were being persecuted, were being, you know, causing all these problems with Rome. And so since the seventh-day Sabbath kept tending to identify with them the Jews, Christians began to minimize the obligations of the Sabbath. Notice this. Impressive indications suggest that Sunday observance was introduced at this time in conjunction with Easter Sunday as an attempt to clarify to the Roman authorities the Christian distinction from Judaism. They wanted to show themselves we are not associated with those troublemakers. We are believers in peace. We believe in the authority of government. You can read that in Romans in several places, how we're told to, to obey the laws of the land until they conflict with the laws of God. And so the Jews wanted to associate themselves, and so they began to, to, to do this to worship some on the first day of the week. And so it's easy to see how these Christians, especially the ones who were living in the capital of Rome, led the way in disassociating themselves from Sabbath-keeping. And this, this is greatly simplifying this issue, but this is not a history class. It's a Bible class. So anyway, why was Sunday chosen rather than some other day of the week? You think, well, they could have chosen Friday, you know, or, or Thursday or Tuesday. Well, the pagans in the Roman Empire had been sun worshipers for, for many, many, many years, for centuries. And uh, so it would be easier for the Christians to associate and to worship on Sunday to be able to disassociate themselves from the Jews and to mingle with the Romans. Notice from the Bible Encyclopedia, page 561, says, Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest, Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshiped the sun. So I want to do a, a quick summary of kind of the, the issues that Rome was facing. They had the Jewish revolts going on at this time. And, and during this time, the, Christ, the Christians and the Jews were worshiping together on the same day, the same Sabbath. And Sunday was the day of worship and was regarded as sacred, sacred by the pagans. And so Constantine was faced with this major division. He's got the Christians, he's got the Jews, he's got the Romans, the pagans, if you will. How in the world could Constantine begin to unite his kingdom? He did that by legislation. On March 7th of 321 A.D., Constantine enacted the first Sunday law, and he said this, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all the workshops be closed. This is the first Sunday law that we have historically. And so you can see that now Emperor Constantine began to legislate religion. He began to mix religion and politics. And it was carried even a, a step even further by the Bishop of Rome. Notice 
in 325, so four years later, in the year 325, Sylvester, Bishop of Rome, changed the title of the first day, calling it the Lord's Day. You wonder how we got that title? It's, it's not, you know, we associate it with that John, that verse, John chapter 1, verse 10, where I, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. We talked about that last night. Well, that's where they got the name, but it's certainly not what, as we saw last night, is not the Lord's Day. Listen to this. <clears throat> the Catholic world, this is uh, page 809 in March of 1994, said the sun was a foremost god with heathendom. There is, in truth, something royal, kingly about the Son, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the Son of Justice. Hence, the church in these countries would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name, it shall remain consecrated, sanctified. And thus, the pagan Sunday dedicated to Balder became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. And so this change is beginning to occur. Notice what happened in 364. This is the council of Laodicea. Laodicea is the seventh church in Revelation uh, chapter 2 and 3. And hopefully we'll get another time to talk about those churches a little bit. But the Rome called the council. The, the Roman uh, papacy called the council, called the council of Laodicea. And this is what they said. Christians, now we've come from 321 now to down to 364. He says, Christians shall not Judaize, in other words, keep Sabbath, and be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's Day, of course, they're referring to Sunday, uh, they shall especially honor, and as being Christians, shall, if possible, do no work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, in other words, if they're found Sabbath keeping, notice what this said. They said, they shall be shut out from Christ. This is what the church said. The Church of Rome. All right, continuing on. At that point, at this point, they're not just in, enforcing Sunday worship. They're forbidding Sabbath worship. Notice that. Anyway, remember Satan gave Rome its seat, its power, and its great authority. We saw that in Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. This is all a part of the plan of Lucifer to knock out God's law. Anyway, slowly, God's holy day was transferred to, be, to a pagan holiday. And between, notice this is from a, a book called The Ancient Church by Dr. W.D. Killen. He said, between the days of the apostles and the conversion of Constantine, we'll talk about in a minute, rites and ceremonies of which neither Paul nor Peter ever heard crept silently into the church and then claimed the rank of divine institutions. Some of those things were the worship, the praying to the idols, the praying to Mary. Some of those things kind of got into the church, and that's how. Anyway, uh, it's important to keep in mind that the Bible was not available to everyone at that time. Everybody didn't have a Bible like we've got 10, and we've got stacks of them out there. You can take one for free if you want them. People didn't have Bibles like that. During the Dark Ages, during the, the time of uh, those years of Rome, people didn't have scriptures. And the printing press wasn't invented until 1440. And that's when they really began to get the Bible out at that time. In fact, that was the first thing that was printed. But people were, were not, didn't have access to the, to the Bible. And the doctrines and the teachings of, of the scriptures were just primarily passed around by word of mouth. And so laymen who didn't have scriptures could scarcely distinguish from what was true, what was scripture, and what was tradition in the church. And so few people really knew that the truth as it was taught by Christ and the apostles and what it said in the Bible. So it's easy to see how they could get confused during this time. And so centuries passed, and the Protestant Reformation came on. And it brought with it lots of questions concerning the rites and the traditions that had been taking place uh, and taking the place of God's Word in the Catholic Church. And the cry of the Reformation was the Bible, and the Bible only is our rule of faith, sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. And so folks at that time, some of the, these re reformers at that time, you know, when they began to protest uh, against Rome, the teachings of Rome, uh, countless thousands, they'd say as many as 50,000 people were burned at the stake and killed in, in, a, in a, a variety of ways for their faith during that because they would not turn from what the Bible said. And today, you know, people w will scarcely inconvenience themselves for what the Bible says. 
Here's some more quotes. This is from Catholic Arthur. Author. He says, The Catholic Church, for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. Now, here's a document we looked at last night, the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. And this is that teaches their doctrines through a question and answer format. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday's a Sabbath day. Uh, question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So you can understand all this is going on. We've come to the time of Constantine. Uh, you know, I'm backing up a little bit from the Reformation. You can understand uh, why Constantine would make the change, but why did the Catholic Church, by its own free and open admission, institute this change? And the answer that lies in the, is that we don't understand so much is the, the, the place of tradition in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, one of the main points of difference between the Reformers, the Protestants, and the Catholics, I should say, during the early years, and, and the, the reasons for the Reformation was over the authority of tradition in the church. They would take their traditions and give them more authority than the Scriptures. And so the Reformers said, we only go by the Bible. We don't go by any of those traditions of man. We only follow what the Scripture said. And so the Catholic Church believed that tradition had as much authority as the Bible. Look at this quote. This is from uh, Catholic belief. He says, like two sacred rivers from flowing from paradise, the Bible and divine tradition contain the word of God. Though these two divine streams are of equal sacredness, still of the two, tradition is to us more clear and safe. So they openly took the stance that tradition is more valuable. It, 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 it has more weight than, than Scripture does. And when Martin Luther declared that he must follow the Bible and the Bible only, he was challenging many of the institutions of the Catholic system that was based on tradition. So Luther and the Reformers kept asking the church this question from Jesus, Matthew 15, verse 3, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Why do we do what we do? They proclaimed to them the vanity and the folly, you know, they, as, as they were shared these texts with, with, with the, the Catholic Church and, and believers in the Catholic faith. They said that it's a folly. If, you're, if your belief system is not built on the Bible, it's in vain. In fact, notice this text, 15, Matthew 15, 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You can see how Martin Luther and those reformers would hammer these texts here. And there's others just like this. But over and over, they kept coming at them. You've, we've got to follow the Bible, not tradition. And so the heat kept building up. And finally, the Catholic Church called for the Council of Trent. And uh, this was, was convened to decide finally, what is the position we're going to take officially in the Catholic Church on tradition versus the Bible, the relationship to the Bible. And notice this. <clears throat> this is January of 1562. They finally settled their question in their minds. It says, finally, at the last opening on the 18th of January, 1562, all hesitation was set aside. The Archbishop of Reggio made a speech in which he openly declared that tradition stood above Scripture. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the Scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by command of Christ, but by its own authority. Remember the prophecy? His power said he would think to change God's times and laws. Prophecy fulfilled. The church had, in effect, changed ones of God's commandments. Protestant churches may be more surprised than Catholics over this. Roman Catholics have long taken pride in what they believe the authority of their church to interpret Scripture in the light of tradition. Catholics who are in the know know that. They know that. 
And so I can appreciate the fact that the Catholic system is blatantly honest in their statements of what they've done. They say, hey, this, we believe our tradition is, is stronger than Scripture, more powerful, more authoritative in our lives than the Scriptures. At least they admit it. They say it proclaimly, I mean, excuse me, plainly. Uh, there's, they don't hide it. And so what's irritating sometimes to me as a, as a pastor, when you hear a Protestant pastor condemning, you know, someone or the Catholic Church for, for this, uh, breaking the second commandment about praying to Mary or whatever, and yet they're breaking the fourth commandment. Let's look at a couple of quotes. Cardinal James Gibbons read from him earlier. He says, you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. American Catholic Quarterly <clears throat> Review. Protestantism in discarding the authority of the church has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday with the Jews. So they said, you Protestants, okay, you're leaving our church. You're separating from us. If that's true, then you can throw out this, script, this, this idea of, of putting tradition above Scripture. And so you ought to go back to worshiping on the day the Jews worship because that is the biblical Sabbath. So the Catholic Church was saying, okay, you leave us. You need to go back to worshiping on the right day unless you're going to follow tradition. This is the Catholic Church saying this. Carl Keating said in Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 38, he said, Fundamentalists meet for worship on Sunday, yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate, wor that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. The Jewish Sabbath, or day of rest, was, of course, Saturday. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. Now listen to this quote. This is from a doctrinal catechism by Stephen Keenan. He said, question. It's kind of in that uh, question and answer format. Question. Have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural evidence. Father T. Enright, Catholic again made this bold challenge. He said, Sunday is not the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. Any schoolboy knows that Sunday is the first day of the week. And notice what he said. I've repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who will prove by their Bible alone that Sunday is the day we are bound to keep and no one is called for the money. You know, this is some... Uh, Adventist evangelists, I've, I've heard do this before, they kind of made this challenge. It, you know, I'll give you $1,000 to anybody who can come with me and show me from their Bible that Sunday is the day we should worship on. And they make that claim because they know it can't be done because it's not in the Scriptures. If we're keeping Sunday, it's for another reason. It's not because it's what the Bible says to do, and I'm not insulting anyone, but it can't be found in the Scriptures. And so this is what this, this, this Catholic uh, was saying here. You know, many Christians have no idea about what I've been sharing with you over the last couple of nights. I mean, I know it's, it's been a shock. Um, a lot of folks don't know that this change has ever taken place. They, just, they don't think about it. But, that, but that's why God says, remember the Sabbath day. He knew it would be forgotten. And it boils down to one thing. Uh, when we begin to pick and choose what we're going to believe and follow in the Scriptures... You know, I'm going to pick this part. I agree with this part, but I don't disagree with this part. It, it starts us down a road that, that we don't want to follow, I guarantee you. And when we throw out one part of God's Word, we're going to throw out another part. And, and then another part until finally we're only left with those picked over portions of Scripture that we deem are reliable or believable. Um. The choices we make concerning God's Word always leads us down a path. And I've got a quote I want to share with you. And I'm going to put it on the screen, but I want your permission to share it. Um, I remember when this quote came out. I had only been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian for three years. And when it came out, I was like, what? Um, and the reason I'm asking for permission is because I, I haven't talked much about my church. I told you last night that I pastored here. I didn't, whatever, I didn't make a big deal of it. Um, have I been pushing the issue on you? 
I hope. I don't think I have. I hadn't meant to. Uh, I've not been asking you to come be a, a member of this church, uh, and I'm not asking you to do that right now. I want you to be clear on that. So let me be up front with you. Um, would I like for you to be members of my church? Of course I would. Of course I would. Yes, of course. But that's not my motive. Um, I want to be like Paul. Paul, we saw last night, he says, I want to be free from the blood of all men. I'm just going to share what the Bible says. You decide what you do with it, right? So with your permission, I'm going to continue. Do I have your permission to put this quote on the screen? All right. I'm not asking you to join my church. I'm not asking you to do it now. But this quote is actually an invitation from the Catholic Church. Look at this. This is from the St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21st, 1995. It says, perhaps the boldest, the most revolutionary change that the church ever did, and it's talking about the Catholic Church, happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the Scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. Now, here's where the invitation comes on this next part. Do you want me to skip right past it, or do we want to read it? All right, notice what it says. Catholic Church, people who think that the Scripture should be the sole authority should logically become seven-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. That's the Catholic Church inviting you to join my church. So thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Uh, I didn't say that. The beast power said it. Here's a challenge from the papacy to be true to God's Word. The Catholic, word, uh, said, the Catholic Church says that when we worship on Sunday, we're following them. We're following tradition. They said if you want to keep following us, go ahead. But if you're going to follow the Scripture, another quote. When Protestants do profane work upon Saturday or the seventh day of the week, do they follow Scriptures as their only rule of faith? Answer, on the contrary, they have only the authority of tradition for this practice. In profaning Saturday, they violated one of God's commandments, which on their principles has never been abrogated. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, I'm going to be frank with you because I think we have life and death important issues as we're talking about God's word. Remember we saw that all the world would wonder after the beast. We looked at that several times, a couple of places in Revelation chapter 13. And we saw that all the world would worship the beast and follow the beast and wondered after the beast. And we asked ourselves, well, how is this practically taking place in, in our world today? There it is. The majority of the Christian world is in essence, whether they realize it or not, and most don't. So let me be clear on that. They're following the tradition of the Catholic Church. Listen to what Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees who, who they laid aside God's law and they wanted to follow their own teachings, their own traditions. He said this in Mark 7, 9. He says, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. And so the picture, it gets clearer and clearer. What are we going to let be our God? That is my passion my, th that I feel is that in these last days... We have got to learn to trust the Scriptures more than our feelings, more than our tradition, more than what we can even see, because Satan is going to try and deceive us in any way, in every way that he possibly can do. And if we have not come to the place where we've put our trust in Jesus enough to trust His Word over what we think, there's only two sides. There's only two sides. And when I first learned this, like I said, it was like ugh, a punch in the gut. What do you mean? I like that guy. He's an old German guy. He's, he had a great personality, and he, he would share all these personal slides before. He'd, he'd have us come an, uh, an hour early and share these slides of, of these places. He'd been all over Europe and all these places we've been talking about. He'd been there personally, had pictures there, and I didn't care anything about that. But I just liked him so much, I'd come an hour early and just listen to him tell his stories. And then he'd preach, and when he said that that night, I was like, what? You've got to be kidding me. Where is this coming from? But I had to rethink. I had to start thinking, you know, what, why am I doing what I'm doing? 
Am I following the Bible? Am I following tradition? Am I following my feelings? Am I following something? This is what my mom and dad did, so I'm going to do it. Is this what, whatever, it's whatever reason other than what the Bible says. And I had to think about that. You know, I'm not saying that those who worship on Sunday are lost. I'm not saying that. We're all in a growing relationship with the Lord. Most people are not aware of what you have learned in the last few nights. But God asks us to live up to the light that we've been shown. It's as simple as that. People often ask me, they say, well, what about my parents or my grandparents? They didn't know, know about this, and now they're passed away. Are they going to be lost because of that? No. Those in the past who didn't know this truth are not condemned. You're not condemned for what you don't know. You get condemned for what you do know. Acts 17, verse 30 says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at. In other words, when you're ignorant about something, other when you're not aware of something, don't know something, God winks at it. He closes his eyes. You know, it's like you do your, your kids. When they're little, you, you hold them to a lot lower level of accountability. But as they grow older, they give you back talk or they do wrong things. They're held more accountable, right? And that's what God is saying. He says, once you know, once you teach your kids they shouldn't do this, they're held accountable or they should be, right? And God's saying that about us. He says, you know, when you didn't know, I didn't hold you accountable for that. He said, but he goes on, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. He says, once you know, it's a different story. God doesn't condemn people for what they don't know. Beautiful text. I've got two more texts I want to share, and we're closing. But a beautiful text that I, I, this afternoon, I just I had to get it in here. I, I, I told my wife, I said, man, this sermon's getting longer and longer. And, uh, but this is one of those texts I just had to put in there. I loved it so much. It affected me so much when I first heard it those 28 years ago. It says, by, now by this we know that we know him, talking about Jesus, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. He who says he abides him in him also, uh, ought also to walk just as he walked. We want to follow Jesus. God rejoices for a group of people who are willing to walk in the light they've been shown. In fact, God, we've looked at this text before, so our last one tonight, Revelation 14, 12, speaking of that remnant people, those people who are alive when Jesus comes, God said, I've got a group. I'm getting them together. And he said this about them. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Um, we're about to pray. And while we're, pray, we're going to pray, I want to ask you to do something. We took a stand last night, a couple, couple nights ago, for Jesus. And, and I'm going to ask you to stand tonight, and I'll tell you why, what the conditions are. I'm not saying if you stand, you're saying, I want to be a member of your church. Okay, so let's make that clear. That's not what I'm saying. What I do want to say is, is when we pray, if you'd like to say to Jesus, you know, uh, I want to be a part of a faithful group that's going to be following you and following your word until you come. I want to be faithful to you, Jesus. Stand with me now, if you can, as we pray. Father, tonight, um, we've, we've heard a, a, it's a, very enlightening subject for many, uh, but it's Bible truth, and it's, it's a word that um, is important for us here in these last days to understand. And so I just pray, Father, that your spirit, that you will, you will move on each one of us, that you will empower us to follow you. And, and again, Lord, I, I want to be very sensitive to the fact that there are some who have heard this, this information for the first time. But Jesus... Um, uh, Hebrews chapter 4 talks about your word as a double-edged sword. And, and so it cuts, but Lord, also you are the God of comfort. And so we're asking you to bring us peace. We're asking you to bring us your Holy Spirit's comfort and guidance as we look at your word and as we seek to do our best through your power to follow you till you come. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated, if you would, for just a second. Tomorrow night.
uh, final events reveals the mystery of death. We'll back off of this subject we've been talking about. I know the heat's been on. It's kind of been, I mean, uh, uh, metaphorically. And so we'll back off of that. I want to talk about a very interesting subject. I know you'll find enlightening tomorrow night about heaven, hell, purgatory, all those things. Monday night and Tuesday night we have off, but don't think the seminar's over. We're going to pick up on Wednesday night with God's Strange Act, and then Thursday night, Revelation's Millennial Reign. So uh, make sure tonight when you leave, you picked up your handouts. If this, you've been here seven nights, you're counting this morning, and tonight, pick up your concordance. Good night. God bless you. Put your questions in the box if you have any.